Colin. Cool. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, so it probably goes without saying that I'm really excited to be chairing uh, this this talk this evening. Um, these these guys are two two legends, I think, in in the Acorn gaming scene. They've brought some amazing titles to to the Beeb and and, and the Electron. Um, Daryl, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, Daryl and Gary worked together at Audiogenic um, around the mid mid 1980s. Um, produced some great titles, which I'm sure uh, many of you, like me, have uh, lost many hours to over the years and, and actually in some cases continue to do. Um, as uh, Dave was saying, they've, they've both recently been interviewed and have given up a lot of their time to, to support the, uh, the Acorn book. I will hold it up at this point uh, just to give it a bit of a nod there. And uh, they've uh, been really kind to speak to us today about their reflections on what it was like really back in the day. Um, the titles that they worked on, um, helped bring to the market, and and a little bit about where how their careers started, sort of pre-audiogenic, um, what they did while they were at audiogenic together, and then um, where where life and their careers took them thereafter. So uh, yeah, over the next hour or so, I'm going to be talking to to Gary and Daryl in turn, uh, asking them to talk us through their their gaming history, how they got started, uh, titles they worked on. Um, we'll obviously focus quite a bit about, around audiogenic, but really keen to talk to them as well around some of the games that they did both before and after, um, and. Also, fingers crossed, hoping that they can shed a bit of light on some of the unreleased games as well that uh, that they may have had a hand in and uh, get their thoughts on on some of those too. Um, I'd be really keen to encourage people to submit questions uh, using the Zoom chat box as, as we're going along. Um, we will obviously be opening up to questions uh, after after the uh, both Daryl and Gary have, have, uh, have spoken. Um, so do feel free to, to fire those questions off in the chat box. Uh, I'll do my best to field them at the end. And I think we'll also um, open it up to, to live questions as well if, if people are keen to, to actually um, have themselves uh, on, the, on the video talking, um, as I say, at, at the end. Um, but if you can stay on mute for the, for the time being, that would be great. Um, so that's probably enough from me. I think we should kick off with, uh, with Daryl first. So um, Daryl has been working in games publishing for, for many years. He's still very active today. Um, is, yeah. <laughs> continuing to publish some uh, some amazing titles uh, at Kiss Limited, um, titles I think for the Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo platforms, including the Switch, I think. Um, so, uh, Daryl, can I can I hand over to you first and just ask, you know, how did you first get started in in games publishing? Um, and I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a second, just so we can get you um, get you on screen for a, for a few a few minutes. Okay, sure. Um, so, yeah. Um... So when I basically when I left school, uh, I, I went to photographic college um, first and got kicked out because I failed my physics. Uh, because apparently when when you when you're a photographer, you need to have a science, uh, which I didn't have. So I had to find a job. Um, the job I found was at Redden University working in the bookshop, selling course books to the students. Um, and uh, bizarrely, almost ironically, because I hadn't got any science um, qualifications, I ended up running the science department at the bookshop. Um, and one of those departments was, uh, was computer science. And at that time, it was one single shelf of books. Yeah. Um, and this, was, this would have been late 70s, 1979, probably 1980. Um, within a year, that one shelf had become three bays as the home programming division, as the home programming craze kicked off, uh, doing Fortran books and basic, et cetera, et cetera. It just, and it just suddenly became huge. And I added to that department, um, started selling software um, and games was, was part of that. Uh, and very quickly that grew even further um, as, as leisure, not part of the, 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 um, the student's course, because initially, of course, it was the course books that the students had to, had to buy for their course. But I started selling games as a, as a leisure thing, and that really, really took off. So then um, we progressed to actually selling the computers themselves. Um, and the first company we made an arrangement with was a bunch of guys that were selling the BBC. Um, so the first PC that we sold was a BBC Micro. I had one on my desk. Um, I wasted a lot of hours playing Monsters. 
<laughs> Great uh, game. Uh, yeah, um, and it really, really took off from there. So it grew so quickly that the company uh, that owned that shop, which was Blackwell's uh, in Oxford, that a lot of people will know, the shop was called William Smith, but the company that owned it was called Blackwell's, asked me to set up a shop for them in their main town centre store, which I did. And coincidentally, that was directly opposite a games publisher called Incentive Software. Uh, and within a year, those guys had poached me to um, be their operations manager to run basically all of their ops. Uh, those guys had... Um, uh, the, the, the game that launched their company was, was called Splash. Uh, but they also they then signed the Mooncrestor license, uh, and we did Mooncrestor on all formats, including the BBC. So I got back into the BBC uh, from from that. Um, the Ket trilogy came on on BBC as well, uh, and it just kind of grew and grew from there. Uh, I moved from there to uh, Audiogenic, which was after eighteen months. Um, so. I had a, good, a fun 18 months at, at, uh, at Incentive, but, um, you know, they were, the guy that owned them was very much the person in charge. Uh, and, um, you know, whilst I did a, a, a job for him, um, I was talking to Crash Magazine and, and, and getting a lot of exposure. Uh, and it was almost as if he kind of resented that. So we didn't get on particularly well towards the end. So I moved on to Audiogenic and that was kind of the next stage. And I mean, just, just sticking with incentive for, for a few minutes, um, mm. did you have a particular favorite that you worked on that helped, helped to get published while you were working there? Um, well, Mooncrestor was a great fun and very good arcade conversion. Uh, probably Confusion was my favorite. It was done by a guy called Paul Shirley who lived up in Leicester. Uh, and and I, I thought that was really, really fun game. Yeah, yeah. And um, I know, and I think it probably came out just after you'd left Incentive. But I think you were around when Graphic Adventure Creator was was just starting to be developed. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that was the the big one for them that, that broke through. I mean, I remember when um, when Mooncrestor was was taken by um, Dixon's, uh, and um, you know, we in those days it was massive. We we did an order that was worth fifteen thousand pounds. Uh, and everybody went out on the lash because it was just a massive celebration for us. That took us into the big time. But Graphic Adventure Creator really moved them forward and allowed them to expand into bigger offices and bring more staff in. Um, and I think um, I think they they had they became uh, they got some contracts outside of the games industry through that program because it was it was probably I don't. It, it, it's hard to describe, but it was it was much more seen as as a as a application than a, anything to do with gaming. Mm. So it it managed to, it allowed them to get contracts outside of the games industry that moved them into a different area, but also uh, was very financially rewarding for them. So yeah, that was uh, that was quite a big thing. Mm. Cool. Thank you. And um, so you, you said you moved on to, to Audiogenic. So what, what was your sort of first impressions with moving from incentive to Audiogenic? Like, did it feel like a real change for you? Yeah, I, I loved it. It was, it was I mean, the, the principal role I took over was um, their customer services. But um, to be honest, it was a very flexible company where everybody kind of dug in and, and, and did everything. Um, so we, we did a little bit of everything. Uh, and my role quite quickly expanded. Um, they were very, they'd been a very successful company in the Commodore 64 market uh, under Martin Maynard, but they'd just had a merger with Supersoft that was a 50-50 merger um, that brought a lot of interesting product into the fold to work with. And also brought a lot of challenges because uh, the, the CEO of Audiogenic and the CEO of, of Supersoft were individually two really good guys, but absolutely clashed <laughs> together. <laughs> so when you've got a 50-50 split of two people that are very, um, very uh, forward thinking, but have their own ideas and, and their own ideas did not really gel with each other's, 
that kind of made an interesting um, a day-to-day -day, um, life. Uh, but overall, the product was great. I mean, some of the Commodore 64 product they did uh, was also product that was licensed by, um, by uh, US Gold. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Aztec Challenge, titles like that, which were absolutely amazing. Um, but I kind of, I was working out of the, the field office near Reading um, with the old Audiogenic staff uh, and the new staff uh, from Supersoft were based in Harrow. Um, and uh, so a lot of the stuff I was doing was with those old, old audiogenic titles, but I really got involved more heavily with the Harrow guys through uh, Graham Gooch Test Cricket because, oh, yes. uh, because that was a Harrow project, yep. if you like, but I was a cricketer and still am to my, in, in a lot less <laughs> skillful way, but, but uh, and I knew a lot about cricket. So the Harrow guys actually asked me to manage that project. And that was really where um, things, you know, I, I loved that game. I loved working on it. Um, and and things, things became really, really interesting and cool there. And then, of course, that, that was also a BBC project as well as uh, all formats. So, yeah. Uh, so that, that was great. Um, and then the big thing that happened, of course, was that um, Audiogenic inherited Icon software. Mm. Uh, and they inherited Icon mostly because uh, Martin in the field office, uh, we had a, a, repli a, a tape replication plant uh, where we, we basically duplicated cassettes for lots of companies. And one of the companies they duplicated cassettes for was Icon Software in Newcastle. Uh, and Icon stopped being able to pay the bills and the debt was so large that when the administration of Icon went through, uh, Audiogenic actually, uh, as part of their payment, got uh, the rights to all of the Icon titles. And that's right. really where I became totally involved in the BBC because that project was handed to me. It was like, there's this bunch of blokes up in Newcastle who've got a load of good games can you go up there and see uh, which of the games are good and which of the um, which of the developers are talented enough to work with? Um, and you know, Gary and a few other people came under that second threshold, and and, and that's really where I, where I became a expert, if you want to call it that, in the BBC. And what was it that you were looking for when you know you say you were sent up there to see you know what what were the good games? What did you look for in a in a game to that that would say yeah this is this is something that could sell? Well, a lot of it was gut feel. Um, you know, they 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 were all a good bunch of blokes. We we immediately you know I think first first evening I went up there met them and then we went to the pub afterwards, which is always the best way to break the ice. <laughs> uh, some had already. Um, known that the company was folding and had made their arrangements to, to move elsewhere. Um, some hadn't. So that was kind of, it was almost written in stone anyway, uh, that some would be, would be happy to move over to us. But, you know, there, there were some titles um, that, that, you know, that, that were already, um, that, that were great that had not really met their potential that we thought we could do stuff with. Mm -hmm. And over the coming years, you know, we, we released them on their own. We released them in bundles, you know, stuff like Wizzy's Mansion, you know, uh, Bruce yeah. Nesbitt was, was, yeah. was uh, you know, he's an absolute nutter. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, it was, it was a very um, creative game. Some of Gary's old stuff, uh, uh, Kevin Blake had done a number of games that, that that were great, um, and Kevin's uh, co-worker Phil Scott, as opposed to Peter Scott, mm. uh, uh, actually became a colleague of mine many, many years later working for NVIDIA. Um, but they they'd done some really cool games together. So there were there, there were naturally a number of titles that stood out as as being Bug Eyes. I think was was one of them that stood out as being fun and and had potential. Um, and we had we had a lot of uh, things going forward that that could make use of those titles. So we had a we were just signing um, an early contract with Woolworths that later on became an exclusive contract with Woolworths. 
that allowed us to use back catalogue titles in, in very creative ways. Mm. So there was a lot there that we could use. But also there were a lot of guys like Gary that we could work with who, who were off their own back developing titles that they were very enthusiastic about that we also became enthusiastic about, like Psychastria, uh, Thunderstruck from Peter Scott, um, all of which you know became really good hits for us later on down the line. And so just touching back on that Woolworths point, wasn't there was quite an interesting name, wasn't there, for that uh, series that, that I think you, you mentioned? Yeah, yeah, we, we 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 had a we had a meeting with Woolworths and that they'd asked us to uh, do a budget line for them, a, a two ninety nine exclusive to Woolworths line. Um, and I, I struggle now to remember how it happened, but but we came up with the name Bogey's Pick, uh, <laughs> and and the uh, icon in the, the the icon for logo for the for the series was basically a, a young Humphrey Bogart with his finger up his nose, uh, which was kind of typical of, of target market for Woolworths at the time, but it, it it did really really well. It was it was a nice nice little series and it allowed us to release titles that probably wouldn't have been good enough for us to release full price. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it was Woolworths Online, which was, it was fun to work with that. Cool. Um, oh, there's Kevin Blake there. So, uh, one, one question that uh, I think actually is kind of via Dave is, do you, do you know much about Fruit Raid and who, who King Rat was? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was, it was, it was very, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, uh, Gary will tell you this later on when he talks, but everybody at Icon kind of were, that we signed was producing stuff for us, but also had their own little sidelines doing stuff for other people under different names. Mm. <laughs> so that's probably <laughs> the, the history of King Rat. Um, Gary had his own. Uh, Peter Scott had his own. Yeah, most, most people were were um, multi-processing, let's put it that way, at that time. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was another one I saw in the credits for an audiogenic game called Crazy Dave. I think it was another uh, another name. I'm not quite sure who that was. but <laughs> mm, mm, yeah. um, And uh, in terms of your, you know, you obviously were at Audi- Audiogenic for a few years. And then and then after Audiogenic, um, you worked for some of the Maynard titles, Godax and Top Ten. So how... how how did you find yeah, us so, there? So there was an eventual parting of ways between um, Martin Maynard and Peter Calver. Uh, Peter took the Supersoft brand back and, and the Audiogenic brand as ASL um, and, and moved that forwards. Um, Martin uh, restarted as Maynard International. Um, I was offered jobs with both companies and it was a very, very difficult decision, I have to admit, at that time. Uh, and and the, the main decider for me, which is probably not the right reason, was that I'd just got married and just bought a house in Reading. Uh, and it was a bit of a slog to get from Reading to Harrow, whereas it was quite easy to get from Reading to Thiel. So mm-hmm. I kind of went to Martin's side, but the other... The other decider for me was that Martin agreed uh, that he would put a bunch of money behind my own label, Godax. Um, so Gax has always been my nickname. It was always my name in the high school table that you'll see in uh, mm. in, a, in a number of the games. Um, and so, um, and, and I, I formed it with a with a guy whose whose uh, high school name was God. Uh, so we created Godax from that, um, and. Um, basically our, our, our idea, which took me to the next level, I guess, was that we would move to next generation. And so we started developing and signing games on Archimedes, um, Atari ST, uh, Commodore Amiga, um, in, in quite the early days. And that was, um, really from, from, uh, relationships that I had with all of those companies through the fact that that Maynard International did duplication for them. So we were the, we did all of Atari's 8-bit duplication on, on cassette and started doing their Atari ST disc duplication uh, in the early days. So, so Godax kind of came from that. Um, we signed Skirmish from uh, Delos D. Harriman, which wasn't his real name again. <laughs> um, no, Stuart Cheshire, I think, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, Stuart, yeah. 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 Uh, and and we, we got... Um, 
uh, and we got a, a few titles from there, which was our uh, kind of a, a sideline full full price title. Top ten was was the budget label. So alongside Bogey's Pick, which was the Woolworths label, we did our own label, Top 10. Hmm. Uh, and we signed up stuff like Gridiron, which was an American football game, um, more football manager than arcade, but did really, really nicely. Um, and it was probably one of the first budget labels that had an art style and a creative um, and a look and feel that, that was kind of unique to itself. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of budget labels followed on from that. But I think... You know, we probably didn't end up being the best selling, but we were probably one of the first in in that area. Hmm. Yeah, that's just, uh, that's really cool. I, I'm really curious actually about the sort of duplication process. I mean, what what exactly is involved, and how do, how do you how do you become good at doing duplication? Like, what's what what is well, I mean, they had, the process? The machinery was was the key thing. So downstairs, we our office was upstairs. Downstairs, they had the tape plant that was you know like a warehouse with big grinding machines that would just crank out the cassettes over and over and over. My main part of it was was creating the masters. And I must admit, in the early days, I messed up a couple of times. So we would do a, uh, a cassette that had um, two, two games on each side. Uh, and if you miscalculated uh, and one side ran longer than the other, the second game on the second side uh, you didn't have enough room for, and and it stopped <laughs> before it finished loading. We did that a couple of times before we learned that that wasn't the thing to do, uh, and got a lot of returns from it. But um, it was it, it was basically, uh, and we had a a um, fast uh, fast uploader system mm. um, that that we signed up that that basically speeded up the the um install process uh but needed to be very very high quality so so it halved the the time that you know you'll remember when a tape would would do that high pitch scream and you'd get all the flashing lights on the yeah, yeah. whilst it was loading we would do that twice as fast as anyone else uh but to achieve that double speed you needed to to be really really um high quality in the, the 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 recording process otherwise it would crash more often um and that was kind of the balance uh and then we had a, a security um you know anti-piracy device on the top of it as well that 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 would um stop people being able to copy it all of that stuff was was part of it mm. um, yeah cool no thank you um, and I mean, obviously, Acorn Gaming and, and publishing Acorn Games is is a little while ago now. So, wh wh where did you go? Sort of, how did, how did you get to where you are now? Where you, you know you're still publishing games, you know, for modern consoles. And did you move away from Acorn just because that's where the the market was going? Or well, how... yeah. I mean, I I I, um, be I became very very friendly with the guys at Atari because we did all of their replication, and they eventually offered me a job managing. Um, the the product the product management of the Atari ST, which mm -hmm. was just launching. So I, I worked for Atari as product manager for the Atari ST uh, for four years. I then became marketing manager at Atari UK and launched the Atari Jag uh, the Atari Lynx, and I then became marketing manager for Atari Europe and launched the Atari Jaguar. And those those may seem like you know good career enhancement moves, but um, <laughs> At that point, the staff of Atari was halving year on year. So by, by, by the time I left Atari as, as marketing director of Atari Jaguar, there were only eight people left in the company. So, right. But, I, but I, had, I had eight years there that were a lot of fun. Um, then I went to Electronic Arts uh, and I ran, I, I worked in their, uh, what they called the affiliate label division, which is now called EAP, Electronic Arts Publishing, which is basically... All of the all of the titles they publish that are not electronic arts titles. So because they've got a massive uh, sales, creative, marketing, etc. division, they actually publish and distribute for a lot of other companies. People don't kind of realise this that are not electronic arts titles. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Accolade, people will remember that probably the Accolade publish it, publishing house. Uh, uh, I ran Accolade within Electronic Arts. 
which was great fun, but had challenges in itself. One of which, just to, to go to the accolade thing, one of the accolade titles was Jack Nicholas Golf. Um, I managed Jack Nicholas Golf. Electronic Arts had Tiger Woods Golf. That was great fun because I had a contract with Accolade that said 15% of revenue would be spent on marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, Electronic Arts were very, very unenthusiastic to spend any money on Jack Nicholas Golf because they had Tiger Woods Golf. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was an interesting thing. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and after that, I got out of the industry for three years, went to work for uh, a company called Whitaker, who ran British Books in Print, which seems like a, a strange career move. But actually, it kind of stands to reason because they used to churn out British Books in Print on a monthly CD, a list of books in print. Uh, and there was a small startup company called Amazon that had asked them <laughs> to actually not supply it to them as a monthly update, but to supply it to them as a 10 minute online digital update. So I took a three year project to manage that process um, and um, then got dragged back through uh, the day that finished uh, and, and the company was sold to um, uh, Nielsen Book Data. I was sitting there at my desk thinking, what am I gonna do now? And I got an email from Bill Raybock, who was my old um, he was my equivalent at Atari in the US when I was in the UK, sending me an email saying, I'm looking for someone to run NVIDIA in Europe for me at developer relations. Uh, and it took me about five minutes to decide that would be the next career move. So I spent five years at NVIDIA, which was great. Loved mm. it, every minute of that. Um, working with independent developers again, which I've always been in. Um, and thereafter, I kind of got back into the Indies, worked for 1C, a big Russian company, for a number of years, and then created KISS, which is my own company, yep. in 2012. Um, uh, and again, similar thing to the, the Amazon thing. Uh, we started, um, we had a bunch of indie developers uh, who had written their games and were looking to try and get them onto Steam uh, as, a, as a next step in their, the game's life cycle. Yeah. Uh, so we started helping indies put their titles on Steam. Uh, and up to this point, I think we've done over 200 titles on Steam. Wow. Um, and, and in the last three years started doing, as you, as you said at the start, uh, PlayStation, Xbox, uh, Switch. And we're now just starting our first PS5 and, and next gen Xbox games. So, so I'm still working with indies. Things have not changed much in very <laughs> many years. I mean, you, you must enjoy it, right? If you've been doing it pretty much ever since, it must be something you enjoy, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it may be that, and it may be that I really don't know what else to do. I, <laughs> I, it's, it's, I, I love working with creative people. And, and the thing that I've always said about indies, and, you know, in the three years I spent at EA, I worked with a lot of uh, big studios, and it just wasn't the same because everybody was told what to do and their job started here and finished here. I, I firmly believe that the, the creation in this industry, the, the, um, the, the unique product and the new unique ideas come from the indie developers. And that was very obvious to me at NVIDIA because you know the, we, we, I started the, we built Bill it in America, I did it in the UK. People might remember the way it's meant to be played thing, which basically, tried to tell developers that um, you know the PC was the format to develop on, uh, but not just um, the the onboard graphics of the PC, you know, the Intel integrated graphics. They should create their art on uh, NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and and uh, ATI were doing the same thing with their, their GPUs. But that's the way that you push technology technology forwards that's the way that that you get to the next generation and and um you know it's all very well someone throwing six million 60 million even at a project that's great big budgets get you really good um film-like uh cut scenes between the games mm -hmm. between the levels but it's the game that's important um, yeah. and, and i I'm, I'm just as happy 
playing a, a, a game that's got absolutely no cutscenes and that looks like it's an 8-bit game but is as fun as hell to play mm. than, I am, than, than I am at playing something that's, that's you know, I, I don't think I've played any of the big, you know, Activision titles or, or, or any of those massive games at all in the last five years. And that may be a fault of mine, but, but you know, I'd much rather play a game that's immediate and fun and, and captures my imagination. We did a game um, at, at, uh, at KISS um, that was nominated for six BAFTAs um, and won two of them and sold 250 copies. Whoa. <laughs> yes. you know, Gosh. It, it, and that says it all for me. I, yeah. I, I, and yeah, we, we didn't make that guy rich. We have, there are a couple of developers. One guy I, I, I particularly um, um, proud of who was a teacher? He was he was a teacher who did a little maths game uh, based around a, a maths thing that was really really fun, um, and we made enough for him on that game that he could give up his teaching job, take up programming full time, and then produce three or four really really good selling titles. Oh, wow. and, and and that's kind of what I look back on with more pride than than any of the. I worked on FIFA '96, the Road to the World Cup. You know, and, and I don't look back on that with any pride, but those sort of titles, the, mm. the small indie guys that we've we've made uh, successful and, and allowed them to to take their creativity and skill on is 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 what I'm really proud of in my career. Yeah, that's that's a really nice uh, nice note to, to to end on. As I just hand over to Gary, we'll be coming back to you again, Daryl, obviously for some of the questions um, uh, later on. Um, but um, if it's all right with you, I'm going to just hand over to Gary next. Um, so... You got the translator ready. <laughs> So, uh, Gary, uh, I think I don't. I mean, I almost don't really need to introduce. I think most people will know uh, at least uh, at least uh, several of Gary's games. He's responsible for some, some really memorable titles for the for the Beeb and, and the Electron. Um, plenty of those, obviously, produced while he was at Audiogenic, but but also before and and since. Um, he also developed one of my personal favourites, Sphere of Destiny. So I'm looking forward to discussing that one with him in a, in a few minutes. So <laughs> he's just pulled a face. Um, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing my screen just so we can put uh, Gary on the screen for a few minutes, and uh, just gonna start um, Gary if I can by uh, asking um, how you got started and you know what 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 was it that got you into games development in the in the first place? Yeah, well, I'm nowhere near as eloquent as Daryl, unfortunately. So. Please excuse my accent and uh, my brevity. Um, I got into games because I was a kid and I liked playing games in the arcades. Um, I got into computing um, 81. The school had a Commodore PET. BBC Mecca was coming out and I ended up getting one of, one of those. Um, it was a fun thing to do as a school kid. Uh, First in basic, then assembler. Um, initially on a Commodore PET and a VIC-20, because friends had VIC-20s as well. Uh, you would write longhand on, on back of your maths book or back of your English book instead of studying, and then transcribe into hex manually and take them to, into the PET monitor. Uh, when my Beeb arrived in 82, it was somewhat late because all ACO machines were late. Um, it was great. I had a built-in assembler. Um, you could write 6502 without even thinking about it. It was, it was just fun. And me and a few other guys I just, just wrote software and, and shared it around the school. It was it was a fun thing to do. Um, I don't know what to say. I wrote some notes down actually earlier. Um, my memory is terrible nowadays. Um, I could read verbatim what I've written down. But it's bad in the English as well, so um, I'll try and read this. Uh, it was purely because at the age of 14, uh, when I first used a computer, it was a Commodore PET, and I saw a game called Pet Invaders. I uh, also um, played games in the arcades, as I said, in a local cafe in our high school, um, writing simple games on school computers, friends' computers, and then my own computer. Um, and so back then, I was, I was like Planetoid, Snapper, Monsters. Um, I think it would be Arcadians as well. I can't remember now. Um, 
I know with 10 quid each, and 10 quid back in 1982 for a, like a 14-15 year old kid was, was a fair bit of money. Uh, so we wrote our own. With one exception of planetoids, because my maths class did a maths all level a year early, and we all passed, so my parents bought me a game. It was planetoids. And I was hooked on Defender ever since. I've got a Defender machine upstairs in the games room, mm-hmm. which, hasn't, which hasn't actually worked now for about 15 years. Yeah. Um, along with a pool table up there, which is covered in all kinds of crap instead of playing pool on it. Um, and, and about maybe 83, um, normal O level year, I wrote a number of games and a compiler for MicroPower. Well, I wrote a compiler and set the MicroPower, and they accepted it. They were going to publish it, and they gave me a floppy disk drive. I thought, hey, this is great. This I can now write software without having to worry about uh, compiling it and it crashing and wiping all my source code from memory. I actually save it every time before testing it. So once I had a, like a, a floppy disk drive in 83, I wrote more games, uh, some of which eventually got published by the online publisher, uh, Micronet 800, which is part of Prestel. Um, yes, catch up. yes that's, that's them. Well, amongst them three, it was actually Positron as well. That was just one of a batch of four games I wrote in in the summer of 83. Um, there was no sort of reason for that. I was, I was enjoying writing software. Mm-hmm. Uh, I sent them, I think I sent them all of them to Micropower, and they accepted Positron. I don't know why, it was horrific. <laughs> uh, it really was. But at that point in time, I didn't know there was a, a new Acorn machine coming out called the Acorn Electron. And obviously, a Positron is the antimatter particle version of the Electron. Um, and that appeared to go down quite well, I guess. Um, positron itself is a crap game, it really was. It was just, I mean, you, as an example, uh, back in those days, people put various names in high school tables. The aliens in Positron were based on my friends in high school. I was like bum fluff. Uh, that was a guy called Ian. He, he, he became a major in the army. He went off to Sandhurst. Um, Megabod, he is now self-employed. His younger brother is now the acting uh, interim CEO of PHE. Uh, <laughs> we'll not go there. Um, Hep Hep, a guy called Paul Hebel. He's He was a friend of mine and Peter's. Um, he just gave silly names to aliens and games. He never, he never thought it was going to get published. We wrote them for fun. Um, anyway, Mega Power took Positron, and by the time they took it, I actually wiped over the floppy disk drive, uh, the floppy disk containing the source code for that. So I went out to Mega Power and Leeds, and we did a basically an assembly of BBC Positron. I went through hand by hand, line by line, modifying Positron on the printout, and poked the values back into memory to create the electron version. It really was a hack. Um, wow. But, but, but still, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd lost the, the, the source code for it. Um, and to be honest, with all the floppy disks I still have, I'm not even sure I've still got the source code for the other three I wrote roughly the same time. And there were other games as well. I wrote a scramble type game in mode seven, but I think I, was, I wrote that in 82 as opposed to 83. Mm. Um, again, it was like an assembler, like software scrolling 1000K, 1000K, 1000 byte screen in 6502 was no problem. And it gave a reasonable sort of rendition of what a scramble looked like in the, in the arcades. Um, I forget what the question was now. <laughs> no, no, How would I get into gaming? It's all really good. I'm, 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 the question I'm burning to ask actually is: is how um, how did you learn to do assembly coding? I mean, like basic. That seems like that was something that maybe even schools were teaching back then. But assembly yeah. programming. I mean, we were lucky. Um, my physics teacher uh, was a computer hobbyist, a guy called Melvin Bell, um, who was watching this, um, or even watching the recording later. He. I was a group of us at school who like, were really into computing. Uh, we were all got the computing bug, we were all hooked and like, we probably spent more time playing with computers than we should have been doing revising for exams and whatever. And anyway, this, this guy, Melvin Bell, Mel Bell, um, he did the first year of the computing the computer studies course, which we all did. And he knew 6502 Assembler and he was doing it on the Commodore PET. He had this book called The Pet Revealed, um, which was great. It had 6502 mnemonics and uh, hex 
uh, conversion tables in the back, which we all thought of copied and took home. And we could actually sit there and instead of in, in lessons actually doing English, maths, physics, chemistry, whatever else, we were sitting there actually writing the sum down the back of our books and then transcribing manually into hex. Um, so you might write a, a game in basic on a Commodore PET and you want to do some effect, you then just call up a bit of assembly you've actually put in the memory or typed in via the, the monitor from, a, from the hex derived code you've got. Um, so it was in this natural progression, you couldn't get performance out of a, a one meg Commodore PET, so you you wrote an assembler yeah. or you wrote the bits that were relevant to run at high speed in the assembler. Um, it just went from there. It just it's it didn't seem alien. It didn't seem different. It just seemed a natural progression. Hmm. Uh, something that seems lacking nowadays. Uh, I recently did a, a university study on um, how software engineering is actually detrimental to the, the life on this planet. Basically, people write in high level languages, uh, interpreted language, or high inefficient languages, using inefficient algorithms, and so on and so forth. And the amount of fossil fuels we're burning to, to account for all this crap software, um, quite literally, um, it, it, it's outrageous. So what we, we what we thought back in the 80s was a normal thing to do, right in the sum, like otherwise the software performance just wasn't up to scratch. Mm. People don't do that now. They go, oh, well, I'll just call that library here or I'll download that library and drop it in, into, into my code and call it up. They have no comprehension of that library is efficient. They don't know if it's a bubble sort, quick sort, or some of that kind of sort. As far as they're concerned, they put data in, they get data out. They don't care about the performance. We had to back in the 80s. The machines weren't up to it. Mm. Um, so you had to do assembler. Um, simple as that, really. Yeah. No, I mean, it's 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 impressive. Um, I mean, I've struggled to learn it myself, but uh, yeah, I'm always impressed by people that can that can code in assembly. Um, before we before we move on to the audiogenic um, era for you, I, I'm just curious, how did you um, how did you get to work on the Doctor Who game? I mean, it was an official BBC tie in. Was it something that that you were asked to do or you, you wanted to do? Um, well, after Positron, um, I started developing other things in '84. Um, that was my first year of, I was my year of lower six in school, and uh, Megapower came to me and asked if I would convert uh, Simon Phipps. Is it Simon Phipps? I think it's anyway. Um, Jeff Power Jack for the Commodore 64 from the BBC Micro. Um, so I, I converted that for them. That wasn't a problem, and I got another Commodore 64 as well. It was 6502 anyway, so it was no great, no great shakes. Just you get another the IO, the hardware, the, the graphics processor, whatever. And then in 85, I got a call, I can't remember from Bob Simpson or um, Ian Clement or Alan Butcher, I was one of the guys at, at uh, Micropower. If I wanted to do the follow up of a game they released called Castle Quest, I thought, yeah, great. Um, what's that I lose? It's a conversion, virtually guaranteed money. Um, I was doing my A levels, so yeah, no problem. And I was we were working through it, and then basically it came clear that it actually was going to be Doctor Who. And I wasn't meant to tell anybody it was Doctor Who, probably <laughs> told my parents. Um, my mother had to sign my, well, to that point anyway, my, my mother had to sign my contracts because I was under 18. Um, so legally speaking, I, my mother signed these contracts for games, not me. Um, and I had the, the name Doctor Who on as well, so obviously it became quite apparent to our parents when I was writing. Uh, I thought it was quite cool at the time. I was like 17, now turn 18, uh, writing a, a, what was deemed in the UK is probably quite a, a title that had a, a major name to it, yeah. which wasn't really the norm back then. I mean, obviously in the years to come, like, uh, movie tie-ins and TV tie-ins became quite commonplace. Mm. Uh, 85 on the B Micro wasn't the norm. Um, it, was, it was a nice thing to do. Uh, yeah. We got to go down to Leeds for, for about a week, and I should have been doing my A-level exams, um, or revising for them, I should say. And uh, me and Tony Southcott just went to the pictures, went to the pub, um, sat all day, make up our offices, these are the, with the guys down there, working out puzzles, sort of want to put in the game, and so on and so forth. Um, it was just fun. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's a fun game as well. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so but I think I'm right in saying that the, the, these couple of games that you did for Icon Games, I know when we spoke yesterday that uh, there's a bit of a possibly a, a, a not not the best experience for you, right, in terms of um, what you saw for them. Well, publisher-wise, it wasn't a fantastic experience. They were relatively local. I lived in Bedlington, and they were in Gosforth at a distance of about 12 miles. Um, and back in 84, I didn't have my driving license. I only just turned 17, so I didn't have my driving license anyway. Um, so they were local, it was convenient. I took some games along, these two in particular, and they said they'd publish it. I don't recall getting any money for it. Um, yeah. <laughs> not, a, not a good problem. But more about the games themselves. One goal actually an experiment trying to get the uh, my, that was my first attempt in hardware scrolling using the 6845. Um, and if I remember correctly, it was pretty dire as well. Actually, that, that game, as far as scrolling was concerned, actually the game was pretty dire as any as well. But the, by I had bad flickering and such like. But anyway, I, I, that's how the how 6845 scrolling worked. Ultron was what Positron should have been. That is, mm. it was more, it had, I spent time on it. I, Positron was just knocked together quickly in a couple of days. Ultron, I spent a few weeks on it. Um, little things like that. The, when the aliens dropped bombs, they would, they would gradually move towards you and high, higher levels, they would, they would move faster towards you. Um, the school and star fields, um, the attract mode. I spent time on it and that's what, it should have, that's what, what Positron should have been, but never was. And let's face it, it was pretty much a rip off of, of golf anyway. Um, golf was in a local, local cafe. Um, we played that quite often, along with like Star Wars and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I liked Ultron, it's probably one, one of my favorite games because I actually spent time on it. And you, 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 I know it sounds sad, you have an affinity to things that you create, and if you, you spend time on something, you get you, you feel more for it. Whereas one go, Positron, there were just like things that you just knocked, knocked up quickly and someone wanted to buy them. Hey, so so be it. Yeah. So obviously, I think your, some of your audiogenic titles are, are, are very well known and Psychastria is probably one of the, the most well known. Um, what was the story behind this game? What was the sort of inspiration for it? Uh, it was a blatant ripoff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a Commodore 64 when I was doing work for Micropower, a Jeff Power Jack, the conversion. And um, um, Iridium came out. And I thought, oh, this is quite cool, this. And I thought, you can probably do that on the BBC Micro. So I did. Um, it was it, a lot of the code in Psychastria actually came from uh, Star Wars that I started. Uh, it was the first game I'd written that didn't. I, I, just before this this talk started, I noticed that was. Um, I'm not sure what his name was. You mentioned it hasn't used the the, the, the BBC Micro's operating system since 1984. Well, I haven't used it since about '86. Um, I knocked out the the operating system. I did everything from scratch. Uh, which basically meant I had no reliance upon interrupts coming in when I didn't want them to, like keyboard interrupts. I had no problem with this, like um, timer interrupts. Everything was done bare metal, uh, sound, graphics, keyboard scanning, the lot. Um, so, what was I wrote was basically a hardware extraction layer for Star Wars became the base of Psychastria. Um, and in your picture there, Psychastria 2, the bottom right hand side, was actually mm -hmm. the original Psychastria. Ah. Uh, we, well, I think mean, Daryl had probably more of a with the legal shenanigans with Fusion than I am. Um, but um, there was some, some who ha a little late idea, it looked too much like Iridium. So the graphics were changed to something that looked pretty crap, to be honest with you. Um, and Psychastia 2 came out a couple of years, I'm not quite sure it was 89, but whatever. Um, and that basically was Psychastria with original graphics. Mm, okay. Yeah. Nice. Um, so we'll, we'll come on to one of my favourites. You pulled a bit of a, fa a face when I said that, but um, I, I really love this yeah. game, uh, Sphere of Destiny. It's it's really good fun and it's really fast as well. Um, yeah, I've got a lot of the maths wrong in that. 
I really did. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, the first, the first one, the the, the ball. I just, I, I, I don't know how I let it go with the ball looking like that. Um, it's rendered pathetically. The the rendering on this on the sequel was, wasn't that much better, but this is the maths was probably more appropriate. So you actually see that this, this, the the ball was actually a sphere as opposed to like a, a blob on the screen. <laughs> um, again, that was just something that I saw Trailblazer on a couple of sixty four five triangles had nothing to like a, a, um, a vanishing point, and it was all color switching. And the reason there's a, a big large horrible magenta splurge at the top with the, the scores on or whatever is because it was written with Electron in mind. Um, so the second of the uh, 100 hertz interrupts you can have, like vertical sync and then the second one, uh, occurred so you can switch from mode 5 to mode 4 for the text and then back to mode 5. And everything on both the BBC and the Electron essentially just uh, weighted in tight loops, carefully timed tight loops, then change the colour of the palette to give you the motion effect of the road. Um, the actual roads themselves was from a studio and a number generator. Um, so for given a given seed, you always got the same uh, sequence of uh, random numbers, therefore the same sequence of uh, roads. Mm. Um, again, it was something I did for proving I could do a, a PRNG um, raster scanning trips of variable points in time. Um, it was more of a programming challenge than writing a game. Though I'm quite happy someone liked it. Oh yeah, I think it's great. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's move on to to Impact next. Um, I think we've got a photo there in the uh, bottom corner that's actually Impact in development. Um, mm -hmm. This is this one's an, another really good one. I think Daryl was quite a fan of this one too. Um, what was uh, was was this something that was inspired by by another game or? Is, yeah, um, impact on the ST, wasn't it, Daryl? Yeah, yeah, it was, it, was, yeah. Uh, it was. It's still one of my favourite games, to be honest. I played it this morning because uh, <laughs> Dave gave me the link to to the BBC Micro.co.uk uh, site, which I didn't know was even there. And uh, yeah, I was having a bit of a bit of a memory fest this morning, and Impact hooks me again. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, uh, Impact was a conversion from, from the ST version of the same same name. Um, some of my maths on that was somewhat dubious as well. Um, sometimes the angles didn't quite, you know, I equals R, simple physics. Um, I equals a random number on some of these uh, when I wrote this. Um, there was nothing special in this, as far as I recall. Uh, it was just a conversion. Uh, there was no clever programming. I mean, all all use the same abstraction layer I used for Star Wars and um, Cyclastria, Sphere of Destiny. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing new, as far as I remember, in, in this game. Um, the horrible picture to the bottom right hand side of my bedroom, I still lived with my parents, and that was about 87, 88. Um, yeah, the wallpaper was well, I chose when I was about 14 and it's still on the wall. It was horrible. Um, what's interesting on that picture, however, is like we're all sitting here in different parts of the world watching video of each other. And then there we have a, a couple of like, dial up modems, uh, the LEM modem, and something else. I can't remember what it was now. Uh, with 300, 300 board as opposed to like. 56k down and 56 meg down and 10 meg up. Um, also, um, you'll notice that Impact was written on a, 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 a green screen monitor. I'm colorblind. Um, oh. Doesn't matter whether it's in color or in various shades of, of gray, of green, whatever. Uh, it makes no difference to me. That's why some people say my colors and my games were pretty dire. <laughs> I don't see colors very well. Um, that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. Oh, that's cool. Is, I take it the cider is yours as well, is it? Uh, yeah, I drank cider back then for some reason. I then progressed <laughs> from cider to Guinness. And then from, I still drink Guinness in the summer, but more often than not, I drink red wine nowadays. Actually, I have posted since the 1990s. Um, I think that was one of Peter Scott's contributions. Um, he started on the red wine, then I started on the red wine as well. So, yeah, blame Peter for that. And then 
boxes of floppy disks as well. I've still got them full of floppy disks that I need to, to rescue. The very same floppy disk boxes I've still got. Really? The same ones? Yeah. Still, still full of floppies I need to rescue. <laughs> I have to say that Peter Scott is probably the last person in the Icon Newcastle group that I would blame for alcohol beverages. Yeah, you would, wouldn't you? <laughs> Peter, Peter, back back in the 80s, had a natural aversion to alcohol. He would yeah. drink it and he, 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 it didn't agree with him. Um, in about 87, 88, there was a, a friend of ours called Paul who went to St Andrews University and I mean, he eventually graduated and did his master's as well. But he went he went into his bachelor's in astrophysics at St Andrews in Scotland. He didn't like it, so he came back for a year, had a year out. And the three of us would go drinking every night and playing pool on the local pubs in Bedlington. That's when Peter really started to drink. Um, so Peter could probably blame Paul for his drinking. None of you will know Paul, but he was he was a bit of a character back at school. But yeah, Peter drinks now. So um, just uh, after after you obviously worked at Audiogenic, you you moved on to Tynesoft, um, and I think these three are some of your titles from while you were working there. Do you? Uh, I like Saigon, by the way. That's that's uh, it's a Commando inspired game, isn't it? That one. It is. Yes. Um, I'd seen Commando again on the C sixty four, so I started writing a Beep version, but my graphics were pretty dire. Um, you probably recognise them graphics as being quite common to a time soft look. Them graphics were actually done by Phil Scott. Ah. Yeah. Uh, Phil Scott, when he was still a young lad, when he first started Tinesoft, was not a graphic artist, not a programmer. Uh, and then they were done by Phil. Nice. Um, I think Dave Crossfire had, had a hand there as well for the, some of the style, but yeah, they were done by Phil. He learns uh, every day. You didn't you know that? No, I didn't no. know graphics, no. No, Jesus, yeah, Phil was a graphic artist. Um, he started doing software in 88, uh, back end of 88, uh, on the PC. Um, yeah, um, but yeah, but that was a, a game written, um, sold at time soft. I think that was just an out outright sum. Uh, again, there was nothing special in that beyond what I'd already done, other than... Instead of everything being exhort, I think I actually did a, like a, an and an order on that. So graphics actually did walk in front and behind things and just being exhort on, on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, circus games. Uh, I did. A, I started working at Tinesoft uh, as a PYE employee in the summer of uh, '88 after finishing. Well, I, would, I used the, the, the word uh, loosely. Uh, finishing Newcastle Poly, which later became North Northumbria University. Um, and my first task was to write a game called Circus Games for the PC. Back end of that year, I bought my first house and I wanted some money to buy furniture and whatever. So I knocked off the BBC version and the Apple II version pretty quickly. Actually, the, the Apple II version was the BBC version, just relocated memory differently and the graphics uh, pre-processed to appear on the screen the same. Um, it was meant to be in mode one, but we're out of memory, so it ended up being mode five, so the graphics weren't as good as they should have been. The graphics themselves would have been drawn by, I think, Kevin Preston. Um, he went on to do stuff for, was it Valkyrie? I don't remember any those games nowadays. Like, I think it was Valkyrie anyway. Um, in Beverly Hills Cop, I had a hand with Dave Crofts in the PC version. Uh, and apparently, as I discussed last night, um, Kev Blake put credits for me in the BBC version, which I didn't actually play any part in directly. Uh, it was nice of Kev to say, say that, but no, I don't recall actually doing any work on Beverly Hills Cop. Well, the credits, they're all the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, uh, Synchron, now that is, a, that is a beast of a game. That's, I find that one very hard to play. It's really fast, isn't it? 
Yeah, Synchron. I'm not even sure Synchron was 88. I'm sure Synchron was done after say cast year, but before I signed the contract with okay. ASL. Um, so I would have been nearer 86, I think. Okay. Um, that doesn't really matter at all. Uh, I don't think I wrote that without with some kind of uh, alias or pseudonym. Um, yeah, so uh, the superior, but I only went to a compilation as opposed to a, a, a game in its own right. It was a game, a very simple game, uh, horizontally scrolling. Mm. Um, horizontally scrolling is not that like, difficult to do on a bead micro. Um, yes, it was fast, largely because it was scrolling one line per frame sync. Um, so that's like the screen off the. It took a lot. Um, my mind's gone blank. At 50 hertz, you got um, 50 lines, so uh, you've got 30 lines on the screen. So it's just over half a second to scroll past one screen worth of data. Um, yeah, it was probably unplayable unless you already knew what the maps, what the, the landscape was in advance. It's, uh, uh, it is tough. <laughs> sorry? It is tough to play, yeah. Right. But, uh, um, it's good, though. Oh, good. I, I, I knew I ran out of memory on that one as well. Um, there's no high score table, as I recall, and there's only actually four levels, and they are flipped on the X and Y axis to give you the impression of 16 levels, which is a bit of a con, really, but I don't think anyone ever, know, anyone ever noticed. Um, and the, again, the colours are pretty dire, but look fine to me because I'm colorblind. And uh, you you did a few for the for the Archimedes as well for Superior, I think. Is that right? I think Hostages was one of Peter Scott's originally. Yeah, Peter did the the B version of Hostages, and you mentioned uh, Richard Hansen because uh, Times Up went bust in May '90, and I was at the loose end, so I ended up doing the, the Archimedes version. F hostages in the back end, actually in the back end of 90 I started doing stuff for the Archimedes full time as a contract I was a contractor but like full time anyway um, on the hardware and um, peripheral side of things so that was doing hostages was probably a, a good sort of learning curve for getting to know the Archimedes more in depth um, after that I started doing SCSI host adapters and IDE controllers and such like the Archimedes. Mm -hmm. um, in Repton 4, well, quick step back, after I did Hostages, um, Richard Hansen approached me to do a game called Ego for the ST and Amiga. Well, Amiga primarily um, it was meant to be an Amiga game, but the ST was an easy conversion to do. So I did a game called Ego for the ST and Amiga. Um, but it wasn't Repton, it was something completely different. But the emphasis was changed, and back then in 92, yes, just, there wasn't so much Richard, it was his, his brother Steve who actually ran Superior at that point as well. Um, I said to do the conversion from ST and Amiga back to the Archimedes. That's where Eagle Repton 4 came from. It was actually an ST and Amiga game we did for Richard's company called. Oh, it was Utopia, Utopia Software. Mm. Um, well, essentially, when TimeSoft went bust back in the 90, I, I largely gave up on computer games. Um, it, it became more of a, a way of making money than something I enjoyed. I enjoyed software engineering, but not mm. writing games as such. Um, so Hostages was a money-making thing at the time of went bust, so I paid my mortgage. <laughs> Um, a Repton 4 was just a filler, more or less. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you say you kind of weren't so keen on to, uh, on games development. So do you, do, is it something that you continue to do? Has it been part of your career since then? Or how, how um, have things changed? No. <laughs> <laughs> Straightforward, no. I don't even play games. Um, like I said, I've got a Defender machine upstairs in the mm -hmm. games room. Um, it hasn't worked properly in years, it needs repaired. Uh, nowadays, I do embedded systems, hardware and software. Um, back in the 90s, I started off with a company called um, Morgan Electronics, doing SCSI adapters for the Archimedes, um, then IDE, 
Um, then more is branched off into access control systems. Um, we did access control systems for various people, the large government bodies, MOD, uh, private, large private organizations, chemical plants. Um, then I did some other, other stuff for the Acorn Archimedes, and then I got into really embedded stuff in the crypto encryption systems. Mm -hmm. just, just gone from there. It's nothing to do with games whatsoever. Um, it was fun when I was young. It was a way of earning money when I was in sixth form. It was a way of uh, idling away the long summer holidays when school. Um, then it became a way of earning money. And then, I don't know. When Times Off went bust, Times Off was a great company, great guys, a good laugh. But then it just sort of, nah, I guess I had to grow up. Sorry, Daryl. Do you, do, you, do you miss anything about it at all, Gary? Is it something that you look back on fondly? Um, yeah. Um, every so often, you get the occasional email saying, did you write this? Did you do that? Mm -hmm. And roughly a year ago, actually, I got an email from a guy called Mark Gidley. Um, asked, <laughs> asked me to answer some questions for him. So, yeah, it, it, it's nice uh, reminiscing sometimes and going back in time and uh, digging out what you recall mm -hmm. and what you did many years ago and how it was fun at the time. Um, I don't think I could have stayed in the career in that, in that, in that, in that line of work and in, in getting to where, the age I am now and still enjoy it. No, I'm glad I got out where I did. You're quite right. It's not a grown up career. Oh, I know that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us have never found anything else. <laughs> don't get me wrong, I haven't grown up. My wife still thinks I'm a big kid. Um, <laughs> I enjoy fun things. I'm stupid. I do stupid things. We all do. Um, I just don't like games anymore. <laughs> That's the only difference. Um, I think from about 86, I sort of started adding things to code. I was starting to do things like true bare metal programming. You weren't calling up your friend system, whichever key was pressed. You were doing it yourself. You weren't um, doing VDU sequences to change color palettes or do things. You were doing it all yourself directly to the hardware. And that's when I started to realize it's more to, to write programming than writing games. You do the same things, and earn, it sounds really crass, but you can earn more money elsewhere for doing the same thing, not writing games. And back in those days, you were pretty much a one man or a two man band. Nowadays, you have teams of, teams of programmers, software engineers, artists, musicians, musicians, graphic designers, all kinds. And that wouldn't suit me. That is, as Daryl said earlier, indie things are probably more fun than large team of developers, the likes of Vutechnics and Electronic Arts and um, DMA up in Scotland who did, I think was, did, did, did the GT things. Um, back in the 80s, you were one or two people having fun now it's it's too commercialized no it's, it's not the same hmm. yeah no i can i can i can see that um so uh, thanks a lot for for all of the all of the reflections there on on on, on the games that you, you worked on gary i was just going to um if i can just before we go on to look at some of the source code and release titles um jolian are you are you there i just wanted to ask you um if you had any memories of some of the loader screens or cover art that you worked for for any of the games that we've just been been reviewing yeah yeah, yeah for sure no the, the the most amazing thing actually today is that like with daryl i've never met gary before i never had the pleasure but but the loading screen for Synchron was my first ever job, like ever. I was fourteen, and um, and I'd like I'd, I'd sent a disc off of just some pictures I'd done, and then I got a call back from Superior Software, and then they sent me Gary's game Synchron. It was really hard, <laughs> but I was really <laughs> impressed at what else the scrolling was and stuff, and um, and yeah, and so that was the first thing where I got I got a disc of that, and I'm like, oh, wow, I'm a kid, I'm not getting a game that's not even on the shelves yet, and then. <laughs> And then, um, and then, yeah, I just drew a picture for it, and that was my first bit of job. And then Daryl gave me my second job, which is I think doing uh, the Ziggy for for Audiogenic. So like it was to, to do the loading screen for it. So that was just just it's nuts that <laughs> these are the two that are there, and it's great to see them both and hear them both for sure. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a lot. It was a really fun time for me. It was just 
it was to see any of my work even on a on, on something that was maybe in a magazine or on the shelves was crazy you know as a, as a sort of 14 15 year old was, was brilliant and the amazing thing about Ziggy was um so Dean Lester who wrote Ziggy I met when he was a uh student doctor um, oh. <laughs> and uh he was absolutely crazy uh, I remember we, we had a we had a, a Halloween party at my house, and Dean turned up as Doctor Death with his mask on, which is quite trendy these days. But in those days, was wasn't known. Uh, and and the first thing he did was try to microwave my kitten, um, which was actually the cat that was Ziggy was named after. Uh, and then next time I heard from about Dean, which was like twenty odd years later, he was the top man at Windows for Microsoft. What? <laughs> wow. And he, he's now extremely rich, retired, and very, very happy. And, wow. and I'm thinking, <laughs> this absolutely manic um, medical student has, has gone to that. <laughs> so, so Darryl, he's not at Microsoft now, no? No, no, he's, he's retired now. Yeah. That's man, it's just where I am now, so I would right, be yeah. really funny yeah. to <laughs> get, get <stuff. laughs> So jolly, mm. jolly on. Yes, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> you did that amazing picture in AMB Computing back in about 87, 88. Retro, oh, yeah? Yeah, the, what, the, the retro thing. Yeah. Know? Yeah, that was just like, I mean, at the time, I just, I was happy to have anything that I did, like, on, on a page, you know, to actually show to my friends. And, um, and that was just like, I think I just wanted to draw a picture of a game I'd like to make which would, mm -hmm. you know, to be honest, the way that thing was drawn, it'd probably be not that easy to do. I think I even did it in the high high res mode, not like, you know, it's something that you would never get to run fast on the BBC. And I just sent it to the, I'd had like a page in AMB computing before about me saying that, oh, here's Joe and he's only 14 and he's done these pictures for superior software or whatever. And, um, and then I did that picture. I said, oh, could you put this in as an April Fool's just to say I've... Uh, I've, yeah, oh, this is yeah, that, that thing. And um, put it in as an April Fool's and just say it's uh, unreleased or whatever. And I did. And um, and it was just funny because it was just some weird picture that got into AMB later on and just said, oh, this is an unreleased game. And then obviously I got work out of it. So that was, I wasn't stupid. <laughs> I am. Stupid. Indeed, no. But yeah, so that was nothing. It was literally just a picture, which is. <laughs> Which is a shame. <laughs> but, I, yeah. I remember you doing some version of U2's With or Without You on the Amiga that we put into a game and nearly got sued for as well. Yeah, well, well that's great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was going to get you sued. <laughs> but yeah, no, no that's, that's, that's hilarious. Uh, uh, this is bringing back loads of great memories, I have to say. The whole book yeah. did. But um, yeah, this has been a good journey. It's a really good journey. Oh, cool. No, thanks very, thanks very much for for sharing that, Julian. No, um, so before we go to the the Q and A, I just wanted to spend a few minutes uh, just talking about some of these unreleased titles. I'm going to start with Daxis because there were some screenshots which we can see here, but I don't think the game ever actually made it to to publication. Do you have uh, any sort of thoughts or reflections on this one? Uh, well, Daxis was um, half my name, half Gary's name, um, and uh, was. <laughs> probably conjured up over quite a number of pints in a bar somewhere as an idea that uh, Gary and Peter, I, I, I was throwing this idea around and Gary and Peter were saying, yeah, that's perfectly doable, mate, perfectly doable, uh, but probably they've had even more to drink than I had. <laughs> and so we, we started it uh, and Gary did one, I think the left-hand screenshot is Gary's and the right-hand is Peter's, maybe the other way around. Um, uh, but it was a great idea for a game, uh, and we spoke to Dave Reader at A&B about it and told him we were going to do it, uh, and um, I think I may have left the company before before uh, its time came, and I, I don't know why it didn't happen, but Gary, is it right that you, Pete was doing the, the, B, the uh, BBC and you were doing the Commodore 64 version, is that right? Is it? <sighs> wasn't even that, that sort of formal sort of setup. It was a case of like, what should we do next? Uh, I remember doing something on the, on the 64. 
Surely a high score table or nothing else. Um, and both the screenshots you have there on the, on the bottom actually are Peter's. Uh, yeah, I think they are, aren't they? Yeah, they've both got a Peter-esque sort of, sort of like uh, feel to them. Mm. Um, it was supposed to be the, the, the video game that included every aspect of every successful video game ever. That was the idea behind it. it had yeah, that, that, was, that was your idea. So have you done it since? <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, yeah, it was it was a it was an ambitious project. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Is any of the source code for it still kicking around anywhere? Uh, probably. I think Peter sent his discs to um, Dave Moore. Mm, okay. Um, I think uh, I've still got loads and loads of floppies I need to recover and. Um, Discussion last night, later on, rec just various recommendations how I should recover them. Recover them. I have a uh, a cryoflux, which was bought specifically to do that task. I still haven't gotten around to doing it. I have literally hundreds of floppies to try and recover. Um, so maybe it's one day we'll have have the source code back, amongst, amongst other things as well. Um, mm. Lots of other half started games. I mean, Dave, let me a machine back in. 2005, back in 2005. Um, and I managed to recover the Star Wars source, source code, which then got put up on Star Wars to Hell. Mm. Uh, but I have lots of other ones as well. as a game called Wheelie, I wrote, which is like a, a wheel going up and down hills as a scrolling game. Um, lots of other ones as well I want to try and recover. I'm sure Daxus will be in there somewhere. <laughs> So we've got quite a, quite a list of them here. There's a few. There's a few from from Audiogenic. Um, I think the first one possibly was uh, one that Peter might be able to shed a bit more light on. Pillage. I don't know if that's one you remember, Gary. It rings a bell. Um, see, although Peter and I lived in the same town and were friends, and all that, but we we didn't actually work together per se. We never actually did a project, well, bar maybe as Daxter to an extent, uh, where we actually shared shared a game. Um, we did. We would make recommendations and give input to each other's games. We never actually wrote a game together per se, but Pillage does ring a bell. Hmm. And what about the? Uh, is it three D golf or leaderboard? Yeah, that, that that was that was a thing. Uh, I have. Well, I came across more like, quite recently the the book with the the maps of all the various parts of the golf course on. Mm -hmm. um, that, the source code will be in a floppy in the garret in the in the cupboard somewhere. Um, it was that was another one from the C64 a game called Leaderboard. Uh, I thought that can't be too difficult. It's just essentially simple 3D plotting. You got your two-dimensional um, plan of, of, a, of a golf course. That's not no great shakes to render in three dimensions. Uh, you hit a ball and just simple physics. It goes up, it comes down, it rolls along the ground, falls in a hole. Um, it's not, it's not rocket science. Um, I don't think I have to, into account anything like the, the the friction from grass and sand or rest of it at that point in time. But mm. never got finished. Um, but that was a thing, definitely. And Coronic uh, is one of one of yours, or was? What, what was that was some, some, yeah. I know where the name come from. Um, I vaguely remember it. I think that was another 64 one as well, as opposed to the BBC Micro, largely because 64 had more memory. It's still 6502. Everything was still developed in the BBC Micro. It's screwed across the 64 via the parallel port. Um, it was something I started. I can't remember exactly what it was now. Again, there'll be source code for it. Hmm. Um, I don't recall what kind of game it was. I don't even recall what kind of game it was, but it was a a shoot them up or some kind of like power drive type thing because power drive back then wasn't like a both thing that both Peter and I were interested in doing, but mm. now we've got out of doing it. And um Daryl, there's a there's a few here that I think you might recognise. I know we had a brief chat about dead enders yesterday. I was uh do you have uh, do you have any sort of reflections on any of these ones? Oh, I think you're on mute by the way, Daryl. Yeah, Dead Enders was uh, another game that we got a um, nice legal letter about. Uh, 
So uh, it was actually, yeah, the precursor to Dojo Dan, probably, but Dead Enders uh, featured a, a, a guy called Dan, who was nothing to do with anyone called Den, and, uh, and, and his wife, um, who, whose name might not have been Angie, but was something similar to it. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it was quite a, quite a funny uh, adventure game um, with a lot of a lot of links to to something um and we we did actually we did actually publish that i think that may have been part of the bogus pick um war was strange but that did actually come out um but uh, it was fairly short a very i think quite a small adventure game um but uh, uh it would it would be great if someone had had a copy of that somewhere that could be uh, put on the, the bbcmicro.co.uk website because uh, it definitely existed and was published. Mm. Um, Dojo Dan, Karate Man, I don't remember much about, but was a follow-up to that as an adventure. Uh, and I, that maybe that never saw the light of day. That was probably after I'd left. Um, and then Outrun was going to be a, a Godax title. Uh, but Godax, I, I got the job at Atari and Godax closed down before that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Top 10 was our budget label. And I don't remember much about Temple. Um, Powerhouse was, so Top 10 was the 199 budget label. And we had this grand idea that, that actually the slightly better games, we could maybe get a bit more margin and charge 299 for. And, and we called that Powerhouse. Um, uh, so I know that was a label, but again, I don't remember much about Temple of Syrinx uh, as, a, as a title on it, but I know that there were a few, it was a different, so top 10 was was red and yellow and very uh, Woolworths colours, if you like, from based on the um, the uh, the Bogus Pick Woolworths label. Powerhouse was blue and gold. I remember it was a very gold logo, very sparkly because that would justify the extra one pound. Uh, and, and, and the games were, were, were the, the topper end of, of the budget range. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's really what I remember about those. And as, as well as adding some extra gold to, to make games maybe a bit more appealing, am I right in thinking that the press were quite important as well to stimulate interest in, in not, not, not so much the, the games we're looking at here, but games generally? Yeah, I mean, they always have been, they always will be. Um, I, I, I mean, one of the, one of the most recent, um, um, a few years ago, memories. Um, I had a, a girlfriend who who had a um, young son, um, and she lived down on the east uh, on the southeast coast, um, and asked me if she could come up and stay with me for for the night because uh, they were going to see um, a, uh, a talk from a, a YouTube guy in Leicester um, about Minecraft. Um, so I'm still in the industry, still think I know a little bit about marketing. I'm thinking this guy's got you know a trestle table in Leicester Town Hall with a, a sheet wrapped over it and is gonna be chatting about his YouTube channel. It was a sellout auditorium tour, uh, was selling memorabilia and stuff. And, and at that point, that's when I realised I needed to bring some new people into my, some young people into my company that understood the new press. Mm. <laughs> things have definitely changed, uh, and we ended up playing, you know, paying eight grand to twelve-year-olds to say nice things about our game. Uh, <laughs> And that's, you know, that, that's how it's changed. But the press have always been vital. Um, you know, Dave Reader mm. was inspirational to me. And unfortunately, Dave passed last year. Uh, but Dave was, in, in, the, in the BBC era, Dave was just amazing, was totally... Um, Getting a thumbs up from Jolly in there as well. Yeah, aware of everything that we were doing and, and really, really, you know, full on. And the guys at Crash, when I was, you know, back in incentive days, when when we were doing Spectrum stuff, were, um, you know, uh, Roger, uh, just just brilliant guys, and and they still, you know, a lot of those guys, Dave unfortunately isn't, but a lot of those guys are still around in the industry, 
and still very relevant these days. But um, mm. the, the press has changed a lot. The, the whole way it's managed has changed a lot. Even in the years that we've been dealing with Steam, in the early days of, of KISS, we would, uh, James Deputy, who's my, my director in the US, and I would sit up late on a Friday night, wait for everyone to ship their games, and then we would be the last people to ship our games on the Friday night, because that way we would be top of the new releases section over <laughs> the first weekend of the title's life. Nice. That's now no longer relevant at all, because the way their algorithm works is, is, is on wish lists and, uh, kit, uh, and, and Steam reviews. Um, it, it changes, literally it changes every six months and mm -hmm. you just have to be flexible. But the press have always been probably the most important thing. The days of full page adverts in, in a magazine are long gone, but you, they're, they're, you know, you, there are always ways you have to work it and, mm -hmm. and it's getting younger and younger, unfortunately for old people like me. And it's fair to say that back in the days of um, things like A and B computing, I mean, some of these titles actually on this slide would have been, we, we, we kind of know about them, right? Because of rumors that, that yeah. were dropped about them. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure Gary won't mind me, me saying this uh, with, with him on the call, but is it fair to say, Daryl, that people like Gary and Peter were, well, they were like stars, weren't they, for, for BBC fans back then? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I um, you know, my first experience of that was was at uh, one of the um, one of the shows that uh, Alexander Palace and, and, and uh, Gary, Peter and I are standing on, on the audiogenic stand. Um, and there are kids queuing up for all three of our autographs. And I'm standing there thinking, you know, what the hell am I signing my autograph for next to these guys who have <laughs> literally done all the work? All I've done is, is you know, use a 14-year-old like Jolyon to do a piece of artwork and, and, and um, get the game into stores. And, and th these kids are wanting everyone's autographs. <laughs> you must have signed a few autographs in your life, mate. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, when I got on Call of Duty, for sure, yeah. yeah that yeah. was the first time I... Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I've been on the... I carried on with the industry and, uh, and I've been on that end of it where... The game making is, it's actually been really fun working on Call of Duty, but it's not my favorite game at all. It's just fun to make though still. And um, that end of it and signing autographs for like, you don't even know who I am. <laughs> just, I just, <laughs> just sign the poster because yeah, no, it's funny. Yeah. yeah. But then Gary, Gary needs to tell his autograph story, the proper autograph story <laughs> about a show. Yeah, it was Peter's idea or your idea, it wasn't my idea. <laughs> Let people know. Go on, Gary. Well, what is it? <laughs> no, it was, it was the Barbican 87, and we were selling Psychasia in the Audiogenic store. And lo and behold, in walks Andrew Braybrook, who wrote Iridium wow. and the Chrono 64. Uh, so I thought, yeah, right, okay. So I went up, I say we, because they shot uh, Peter was, was nearby as well, and got. Um, Andrew Braybrook has signed the inlay card of Psychastria. He didn't know what he was signing, and he quite happily signed it. And then we told him afterwards what he'd done, and he just wasn't very happy for some reason. <laughs> um, it was probably, probably quite a childish thing to do, but then again, back in 87, Peter and I were, what, 20? 20, 20, actually, no, we're only 20. Mm. Um, Andrew Braybrook was probably quite old by then, probably about 22. And I'm sure Daryl was even older, about 24, yes, Daryl? I was 24, I was 24 yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I recently saw a thing where um, Jeff Minter, where, this is in Atari Jaguar days, was, was described as an old hippie. And I'm thinking, he must have been all of 28 in those days. <laughs> <laughs> an old hippie. <laughs> yeah. Madness. Um, just just before I turn to the questions, we've got quite a few coming through in in the chat box. Um, Jolyon, would you do you have any memories of of Dave Reader that you wanted to share? I noticed you gave a thumbs up when we when we mentioned him earlier. I, I mean, mainly he he really was like so. When I um, I don't know, I guess I was I was always trying to sort of promote myself a little bit, and uh, and I sent I just for whatever reason sent uh, him. Well, not an email, I was about to say an email. It must have been like a letter or something. I can't remember how it was, but I, I basically sort of sent something to him to say, 
you know, I've done these loading screens and I'm only 14. And it was, it was all stuff to sort of to promote myself, I guess. And, uh, but then he went and did a page for me in AMB Computer that you know, was like, you know, pretty much a page's worth of talking about me and what I'd done with the, with the screens I'd done. And I just found that like, uh, that was just really nice. And then I went to, I honestly can't remember which, it was probably something like Olympia or something. There was a, a big, you know, um, game show there. And then I saw him and I just had to thank him. And, you know, I didn't obviously know what he looked like, figured it was him and had a chat with him. And he was just really lovely. And just the fact that he'd even done that. And I think it was actually shortly after that, that I then sent him that picture for the retro thing and said, it'd be funny to make it uh, an April Fool's. And then he simply put that in as well. It just seemed like effortless and he just seemed so lovely. And yeah, no, great guy, really great guy. Um, yeah, sad to hear he's passed so for sure. Oh, thanks, thanks for uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, okay, so I'm going to move move on to the uh, move on to the questions we've had through uh, through chat. Um, actually, I think the first one's from you, Jolly, and um, and I also want to know the answer, um, Daryl. What was the game that only sold 250 copies but won but won the Baftas? Oh, it was um, it, it, it was a game uh, called. Um, uh, oh. It was really memorable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so the, the precursor to it was Horizon Shift. Uh, and, um, okay, help me out here. Irish playwright. <laughs> Irish playwright. Oh, Famous Irish playwright. Dylan Thomas. Uh, no, he's Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> Quite right. <laughs> um, oh. Anyway, it was, it was, it was basically... Uh, um, a, a, a graphic story uh, mm -hmm. based around this Irish playwright. Um, oh, Waiting for Godot. Waiting, sure. Waiting for Godot. Who did Waiting for Godot? Samuel. Uh, oh, is that Samuel Beckett? Beckett. That's right. Yeah. So the game was called Beckett. Oh. <laughs> oh. And, and it, it was a graphic <laughs> story uh, with, with a bit of a bit of a whodunit theme, with Beckett as the hero. And it was brilliantly conce conceived, really, really fun to do. And yeah, sold 250 units. <laughs> oh, that, that is nuts. <laughs> yeah. and, and won loads of awards. So crazy. Yeah. I've got, I've got, another, I've got another question for you, Daryl. I'm just gonna uh, quickly share my screen because there's a, there's a visual to go with it. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully I can get that to come up without losing sight of the question. No, I've now lost sight of the question. Hang on. Uh, I don't know if you can, can you, can you see that there, Daryl, the yeah, picture? Service, yeah. yeah, so I've got a question from, from Chris Evans. So um, we found an interesting dual feature BBC disc for Skirmish and Courtyard. Uh, the label uses C64 language, hit, run, stop. And we obviously couldn't boot the second side game for Courtyard. Do you remember any issues at all with this one? Oh, um, might have been a duplication issue, yeah. Might, might, might have been me that did the master for that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I do. I do remember skirmish was was a lovely fun game. Courtyard was quite quite nice as well. But um, yes, uh, you know, obviously skirmish was inspired by something else, uh, and uh, I think we probably got another legal letter for that. But uh, but uh, I re I really really enjoyed that game. Um, and interestingly, we spoke about this last night, Colin. But uh, so the guy that did this artwork for skirmish Which is terrible, by the way. <laughs> the artwork, yeah. Uh, but he also did the Godax logo, and and he did the artwork for for Gary's um, uh, game that we we looked at earlier. That was Synchron, yeah. based on Arkanoid, uh, or, or maybe not. <laughs> um, was uh, I took him with me to uh, Atari when I went, and he was the guy that produced the really famous and very 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 good, and you wouldn't believe it based on this, but very 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 good Power Pack artwork for the Atari 20 game pack that sold hundreds and hundreds of thousands of units. Wow. So I must have seen something in him despite this skirmish artwork. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because you say that, because I did the, I did that, 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 that picture, the, the, the actual, 
the computer yeah, you... artwork that's actually within the artwork. Yes, I did that, yeah. and that's done on the Amiga in high res because th we thought that would look better. And it, it's a nice piece of artwork, by the way. Box, I'm sure, is like whoever did that. Good job. <laughs> yeah, yeah there, were, there were a few too many colours in the whole Godax logo. Two of them. He's a bit bored of them. Um. So I've got a question for, for Gary, uh, from yeah, Kieran. Um, was there any particular reason why you were obsessed with making games so fast? And uh, could you actually complete any of them back in the day? Um, I could always complete them. Um, that's how I measured the, measure the work. Um, fast, I think that's just like a, more of a software engineering thing as opposed to a game playing thing. It was always a case of like, if you make them faster, um, you've, you succeeded in doing something. Well, you succeeded in doing something. Um, <laughs> it was if you could make them go fast, you succeeded in making them go fast. Anyone can make things go slow. Um, it was just a challenge. Uh, as I as, as like, sort of implied earlier, I found a like, programming a challenge, and the program itself was more fun than the game that you created at the end of the day. Uh, and I enjoyed doing that. I enjoyed trying to eat as much power out of the processor in any peripheral hardware there was as mm. possible. And if, that's, I do that nowadays in embedded systems. I try, instead of throwing processing grunt, you actually optimize your code in the hardware to actually give maximum performance per, per watt. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a challenge to try and make things go fast. There's no chance to make things go slow. <laughs> Hey Gary, I've got, I've got to say, like even working on on Call of Duty, because I'm obviously just doing more graphics now on the, on high end stuff. But I still use so many old school tricks to try and make sure the game does run at 60 frames a second, and that because that that game does, and it, and it always has to. Or, you know, this is before I've moved on to Microsoft now. But yeah, mm -hmm. I do. It's funny. I'm, I'm still. I'm really glad I was in this time where 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 basically you really did have so limited, you know, things to work with and you did have yeah. to do whatever you could to make it work fast. And that's definitely helped me in my career. And it's, and it's funny that I still use old tricks from, you know, from <laughs> early sort of uh, PS1 days, PlayStation 1 or, or whatever. It's the, I'm still using them and they still work. So. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's, too, that's, that's too much sort of like nowadays where someone writes something in Python and that's, that's, that's it. There's, there's no optimization. There's no... Trying wow. to eat every last bit of process of power out of a system. Yeah. yeah. No, it's called a care, and it really and it does actually still make a difference. I think you know it's uh, true. So actually, since we're on that that point around getting getting the most out of the the hardware, I've got a question from Stuart. Um, when you were developing the Doctor Who game, uh, Gary, at what point did you realise you were going to need to go into some sideways RAM? I think it needed some extra 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 resource. Yeah. Right? That wasn't my decision. That was a decision by Micropower. I mean, they already knew what they wanted, or roughly what they wanted. They knew it was going to be a large map um, of the, the, the environment, which, the game environment, as it were. Um, they had already decided I was going to be um, side with ROM. Whether we put the code in ROM in the map and RAM or vice versa, hadn't been, that was my decision. Um, but they already knew it wasn't all going to fit into memory mm -hmm. in normal RAM. Um, but that was probably Alan Butcher. Um, he was the, the the main tech guy at Mega Power. Okay. And actually, on the same theme of of the Doctor Who game, a uh, question from uh, Tricky: Did you did you do the graphics for it? Did you do the design of the graphics? No, um, they were done. Oh, I'm not quite sure who did them. Um, they were done in Mega Power. Um, I mean, my, my power had a, a had staff. They had they were they were also an Acorn dealership, and they had development staff that were doing hardware uh, for the BBC Micro and uh, peripherals for other machines as well. Um, so they had quite knowledgeable staff employed in the office. Uh, they also employed people to um, uh, essentially rate games. People were sending games, and people, uh, had staff to actually look at those games and decide which games they would take and how to improve those games. Um, and they had people who would, who would do graphics as well, I guess. Um, there were quite a large setup. The, the offices at um, the Northwood House, I think it was, in Leeds, was actually there were three or four floors. It was a, it was a big building. Um, and they had people to do all sorts of things. Um, so 
the graphics were given to me on a floppy, already redone, already pre-done. The map was done amongst us, the actual programmers, me, Tony Southcott, Alan Butcher, Ian Clement. Um, but the graphics themselves were, were done by somebody else. Okay. Um, I've got a question for you, Gary, on Psychastria from uh, Kieran. Um, I'm going to read it out because it made me made me smile. The, the level starting alert in Psychastria is quite probably the loudest sound a BBC Micro can produce. Was this intentional? <laughs> yeah, I used to bump the hell out of my mother. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, long, long time ago, far, far away down in Cambridge, the guy who wrote the Beeb... Moss um, deliberately off-tuned the three channels on the sound chip um, so they didn't cause like a, a, a sort of a beat effect. Um, so when you set all three channels with normal sound command to play at the same frequency, they all, they're all slightly off frequency by a very, very small amount. Uh, if you play them all at the same frequency, they're all clocked at the same point within the chip. Um, I'm not sure how, this, how the optical chip worked. Um, but given the straightforward square wave and you had a um, master clock, they all came out on this exactly the same frequency. So all three channels would go high at the same time and all go low at the same time. So you got maximum amplitude out of the chip um, sound-wise. Uh, so yes, it was, it was deliberate insofar as you could make louder sound from the device, but it was deliberately, within Acorn's MOS, it was deliberately made so you couldn't do that. Um, and say Castro had, uh, had already written the sound driver anyhow. Um, it, when, I, wait, when I first wrote it, I wrote it so like, you play a certain frequency on a certain channel, no problem. Same frequency, on all three channels, all three channels play the same frequency. It was purely accidental, I guess, initially, that I could get greater volume out of the device because it all played the same frequency under the, under the speaker. Um, and the reason you can't do it normally is because the MOS deliberately stops you from doing that. They're all slightly off frequency. On a similar theme, for the first time in 30 odd years, I had a quick game of Graham Gooch cricket laid in bed this morning on my laptop on the, on the BBC and the uh, the sound it makes when you get a wicket or hit a four seems to come through every single speaker in the house. <laughs> and all three of my dogs leapt off the bed at that point. <laughs> Amazing. It's white noise, basically. <laughs> um, I've got a question for, uh, for Jolyon, actually. Uh, I'm just going to oh. put you on the screen, Jolyon. Um, it's a question from Kieran. Uh, if I decided to actually make Retro for the BBC Master, would you be up for doing the Pixels? <laughs> oh man I, I would honestly I would love to have time to go back it's funny with Daryl's talking about the sort of um the, the the sort of more indie scene and stuff I would actually really love to do that and um but it's just spare uh, time the time I have to spend just doing these bloody you know obviously quite triple a titles or whatever it is it's it's fantastic I feel privileged to be in it to a degree <laughs> but um but yeah, uh, no is basically the answer. <laughs> I haven't got the time. It's like I cherish my uh, my my downtime <laughs> when I get it. So no, fair I'm enough. sorry. I'd love. To. I would love to. <laughs> yes, but I can't. <laughs> I have wife and kids, and they'd be like, "No way." <laughs> What's that going to end? You? No. <laughs> when did you get time for wife and kids? For goodness' sake. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Yeah, no, it was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. Um, on a similar theme, um, I, and it really is, I think it's a question to, to, to all of you. Do, do you have any interest in uh, retro computing or retro coding? And do you have any thoughts on retro games that are being made now? Um, I've got a, a very close friend, actually my best mate, Ian Hancock, who, who used to work for Cody's, has worked for Sony as well, who's got a, uh, his office is just full of old machines. Uh, and I was chatting to him this morning. He's got a, he's got a uh, electron in there that's actually not got an electron inside. It's got the old uh, AIM um, machine inside it that runs Electron BBC stuff. Uh, oh. And he is absolutely manic about it. I have to admit, I'm much more forward-looking because I'm still doing stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm still um, developing. 
we have some big projects going on that are based around uh, esports and betting. Uh, and you know, our, our latest project is 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 a project that that allows people when they're playing a game against their mate to actually stick a tenner on it as a bet to say I'm going to beat you. Um, which you know is is, uh, and we're working with a major betting corporation in that. Um, so I'm I'm very forward looking in what we're doing. Um, if I play games, as I was saying this morning, um, I will more likely play retro games because those are the games I used to play. Um, I probably haven't played, you know, all respect to, to Jolly, and I've played Call of Duty and stuff, but I probably <laughs> don't bother. <laughs> I, I probably haven't <laughs> played uh, a a new release uh, for four or five years for any longer than checking it out and seeing what we can do different or better. Um, so, sorry, the cats are right. <laughs> uh, um, but so, you know, I, I, I love retro games and I was really, really chuffed to find that, that, that Dave's website uh, has them all uh, there, all of, all of the stuff I used to do because I love the history of it. And, and I'm a collector. And I was actually talking about the fact that, you know, my kids, my kids are, are 24 and 21. Uh, their generation aren't at least bit interested in, you know, boxes and, and, you know, physical product and stuff. Everything is digital. Uh, but even if they collect it digitally, that would be a step forward. I don't want to think that when I'm gone uh, and the history of, of video games is, is discussed, that this stuff isn't there in an archive somewhere that someone can look back on. Mm. But having said that, uh, the last time I showed my son a game that I worked on, which was Fever Pitch Soccer for Atari Jaguar, when he was about 12 and really into FIFA, he played it, looked at me and said, Dad, this is really shit. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of soul-destroying and, and made me think maybe its place is, uh, is in the archive rather than in the, the present day. Uh, what about yourself, Gary? Do you, do you, uh, have you seen any of the sort of modern games and demos that have been, uh, are still being made now for the Beeb? I do, actually. I follow a number of people on Twitter, um, and there's been some fantastic demos on there. Um, X, Zero X Code, I think it's online now, or he was. Uh, he's shown some fantastic demos on Twitter, Mm. Uh, what he can do with the electron? Um, you would have made a killing back in the eighties, um, <laughs> and there's, there's a lot of stuff as well. Um, I was shown some things last night on BBCMicro.com. I think yeah, these are bloody good. These are like, like, if not as good as the um, the arcade machine, which is the mimicked. They were certainly as good as the ones produced by Acorsoft, like uh, Snapper, um, Frogger, the, mm. the ones that it had, I think, oh, and Scramble as well. Um, but personally, I'd, I don't play old games. I've, I've, it's long, even a long time since I even fired up a B micro emulator to play, play stuff as well. Though, so again, saying that, I looked at B micro as well and had a thought, oh, a big quick shot of Doctor Who and whatever, but it's not something I would do uh, ordinarily. Um, just reminiscing, more or less. I'd, to be honest with you, I'd rather play solitaire on, on Windows. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit more, a bit more mentally strenuous, even more, if only slightly. Um, have you, have you, um, have you seen? I think some of the games that uh, Dave might have showed you, I think, were from Tricky as well. Some of his, uh, from his games on the, uh, on the, on the site. That's a Tricky, yeah. I don't know yeah. about this. Yeah, there's, uh, but both, both Tricky and uh, Zero X Code stuff is, is really impressive. Um, I, I've got a bit of a cheeky question for you, Gary. I hope you don't mind it being asked. Um, there's a story behind the completion image on Spear of Destiny. I've heard, I've, I've heard about. Is there, a, no. is there a story to that? <laughs> that? That wasn't her first appearance. <laughs> Long time ago, far, far away, um, about ten miles south of here, actually. Um, there was a requirement for a, a Doctor Who demo uh, for a trade show. Um, 
in being a stupid 17, 18 year old kid that I was, I put a picture of some semi clad female um, that would only show up after eight hours of runtime, um, which had happened just to do so when Michael Power, Bob Simpson, uh, and co were discussing distribution rights with various distributors back, back in the day. Yeah, I, I didn't get invited to the launch of Doctor Who and the Minds of Terror down at uh, wherever it was in London, neither, for some, some strange reason. Um, I used to use, also use the same picture in Sphere of Destiny as a completion screen until someone realised I was asked to remove it and put in something a bit more bland. Couldn't have been me, surely. Was it you, was it? No, no I don't think so. No, it may, may have been uh, Peter Calver. Probably, yeah. 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 He is a bit more prudish about these things than me. Yeah. <laughs> Got more one than I do. Ask for that to be removed, surely. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the Daryl I know. No, um, I got a question from uh, Keys about how thoroughly games were tested before they were published. Did you did, did games ever get published where perhaps there were known bugs, but they just went ahead because of timelines? Oh, uh, who are you asking? Me or Daryl? Uh, you or Daryl, either. See, I would have loved to have been published. Well, I am publishing games these days, but <laughs> in those days, I would love to have been publishing games under. The circumstances these days that you can publish them on Steam and then do a day one patch. <laughs> <laughs> that would have made so much difference. <laughs> yeah, true. The majority of my games were so simplistic that like, uh, a bug was, was shown in space pretty early on. That said, um, it is a bit of a, a strange one where nowadays they, they can issue uh, patches and releases ad infinitum via the internet, whereas back in the olden days, and in the 80s, um, you got a, you got one chance, maybe it's two by sending a set back and getting a replacement. There was none of this sort of like being able to put things right after the fact. Mm. You had the right, right first time. Something that's sadly missing nowadays. Um, a question for, for you, Gary, on, on plat platform conversions. So, did you, if you had to do a platform conversion, was it based upon playing the game? Did you have the the code dissembled from the other platform to to use as a reference point, or how did how did that work? Um, the ones I converted, um, you, you played the game and, and just mimicked it. Wow. Um, okay. Um, Peter did the same as well. Peter, though Peter had the advantage that he was often sent the source code for things like SimCity and the like. Hmm. Um, Compiling megabytes of well, that's probably an OTT, kind of like hundreds of k of source code in C to run the B micro it was like a non-starter. So mm -hmm. he would eventually just play the game and also just convert convert it as well. Um, the only time I would do a conversion um, would be when I had the same processor to target to. So like BBC sixty four, Apple two, yeah. same process. I used the same code. Um, when I did uh, converted rep to Repton for Ego from 68k to ARM, that literally was a line by line transcription that I went back through and, and optimized the bits that are relevant, like the screen draws. Mm. Um, so, unless it's the same processor and written in the same and written in assembler, yeah. uh, well, you would just you would, you would rewrite it. Wow. Um, just because you mentioned it there, Stuart also had a question about Ego. Um, was the Amiga uh, ST version of it ever released? And do you know if the source code's kicking around anywhere? Well, I've got the source code. Ah. <laughs> on, on, on <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually tried to get, uh, it be a few years ago now, I contacted Richard Hansen. Uh, I do occasionally anyway, see how he is. Um, but it was to ask him if he still had the, the machine, or, which I developed it on, because I sent it back to him anyway, the ST and the ST hard drive. There was something I wanted off the ST hard drive, but unfortunately, he flogged it. Um, he saw no purpose in keeping it, so he sold it off. Um, so, yeah, the source, co the source code's available. Um, I'm not quite sure if it got released or not. I honestly don't remember. It was Utopia Software, uh, that was his company he created at the time after Superior. Um, he's probably the best person to ask, to be honest. I don't know. Uh, it was a commission, commission project. I got paid for the project as opposed to royalties. Mm. 
So. Okay, no, thank you. And I'm going to end with a. I've got a question for Daryl, um, and I think we'll we'll probably have to wrap there because we're we're running out of uh, time. But a question, Daryl, you I think um, you mentioned yesterday that you've got some early Atari content up in you know, up in your loft. Do you mm. know if you've got any interesting Acorn stuff hiding up there? Maybe promo items or letters of correspondence, discs, that kind of thing. Um, I mean. No, I mean the only thing I have got is some early versions of Grand Village Test Cricket, which I found on on um, Floppy, um, but I haven't. Uh, I've I've got uh, some of the um, copies of A and B Computing, but I think Dave has has reproduced all of those anyway. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I've got the original magazines. Uh, in the man cave down at the bottom of the garden, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I don't think there's anything anything more than that that I've got. Um, most of the stuff that I've got actually is Atari stuff. Um, I send a bunch of stuff to the um, National Computer Museum in Nottingham, which I think has now moved to Sheffield. Mm -hmm. uh, I had some some Atari Lynx early ROM cartridges that I sent for review, and the interesting thing about those is is the person. Uh, they were reviewed. They used to be. I used to send them regularly to review to Games Master magazine, and the person that reviewed them was a lady called Jane Goldman, who is now Mrs. Jonathan Ross. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, that's cool. oh. yeah. Uh, um, and uh, I, I had a recent conversation with Violet Berlin, which some of you may remember, who who used to be a, a presenter for for uh, Games Master on TV. Uh, I had a, had a chat with her. She's still around the industry doing doing stuff, but uh, I don't think I've got other than the, than the Gooch stuff. I don't think I've got much going back to to those days. Uh, I might have a couple of um, early top ten cassettes, but that's about it. Fair enough. You do know who PS first foray into uh, TV was, don't you? Well, Violet. No, Peter. Oh, Peter. No what? His first project on TV. He was on Games Master. Was he? Okay. Yeah, Jane Newland. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I know he's he's done very well for himself these days as a as a TV producer. Mm. He worked with Chris, the other Chris Evans, not the Chris Evans that's in this call, but the the uh, the, the famous Chris Evans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm really sorry to have to to call it to a close because this has been so so much fun uh, chatting to to all three of you actually. Um, it's been a really really enjoyable couple of hours, actually slightly more than two hours now. Um, can I uh, ask everybody who's on who's on the on the call to maybe turn on your cameras and unmute to give a big round of applause for for <laughs> Gary, Daryl, Jolyon, and and Peter in absentia as well, please, because I think this has been really fantastic. Yeah, I hope you get well soon as well. Yeah, indeed. That's been fun. Really fun. Daryl, why didn't you make a cricket game? Well, these days. No, well, any time. Did you after Graham Gooch? Did you never make a cricket game? Uh, oh no, we did. We did. We've done cricket captain. We've we've published cricket captain. Oh, there you go. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah, you wouldn't have done. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Am I uh, handing back to to you, Dave? Sorry. Yeah, we're all done. Just need to, again, thank you everybody for joining us and all the, all the guests, Gary and Joe and Daryl. We hope that Peter can hopefully rejoin us in the future. Thanks, Colin. Incredible job hosting today. And of course, thanks, Mark, for producing such a wonderful book. Hey, Ed's got it too, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We've got, I can see quite a few people are holding their books up now. So there we go. <laughs> Nigel's got it up. There's Ed, Matt. Matt. I'm holding my book as well, so uh, and I'll we just leave you. <laughs> I'll just flick onto page two of the gallery because we've got almost fifty people on. So if, if you're on the second page of the gallery and you've got the book, feel free to uh, to wave it around. Mister Dave Footit has got it there. There's Stu Badger. Great to see you, Gary. Finally, <laughs> who said that? Me, Joe. <laughs> oh, thank you, Joe. Uh, it was really good to see you, man. Excellent.